Welcome to the Australian Prescriber Podcast. Australian Prescriber, independent, peer review, and free. Hi there, I'm Joe Chia, your host for this episode. Today I'd like to welcome Professor Nick Zwa. Nick has written the article Travelling with Medicines in 2018, which you can read in the August edition of the Australian Prescriber. Nick, welcome and thanks for taking the time to speak with me today. Thanks, Joe. So to start, let's say that a patient walks into the pharmacy and says that they're planning to travel and they ask you for some advice. What are some of the most important things that we should keep in mind and tell our patients before they travel? Well, I think the key issue, Joe, is really people planning ahead because getting organised means having enough of their regular medicines that are in date for the duration of their trip. Uh, it may also mean having a doctor's letter that summarises their medicines um, and, it, and it can also mean sort of understanding how they look after their medicines during travel and what to do if, if things go wrong along the way. So what sort of things can go wrong? Well, firstly, I just start to say by, by making sure people have sufficient supplies of their medicines for, for the duration of travel. Uh, people don't want to run out of a regular medicine halfway through their trip and then find it's very difficult to get access to that. Um, so, you know, for PBS medicines, it generally is no problem taking six months supply. And of course, the doctor can write Regulation 24 on the script to allow the pharmacist to dispense all of the repeats uh, at the same time. Uh, for people that have particular uh, health yeah, issues such as diabetes, it's a little more complicated. One of the things that um, people sometimes get concerned about is storage of insulin during travel uh, and thinking it needs to be refrigerated for the whole time. That's not the case. And it can um, travel in the hand luggage uh, on the aeroplane perfectly safely uh, and I would suggest not uh, asking the cabin crew to put it in the fridge. It's just a risk of it getting lost. Uh, similarly with um, thyroxin tablets, as people who are taking thyroxin will know, it's generally recommended to keep those stored between 2 and 8 degrees Celsius, but that's not necessary for um, short periods of time such as air travel. The thyroxin medication will be perfectly stable uh, at normal temperatures for several months. So you mentioned, you know, planning ahead, that involves thinking about vaccinations and also for, you know, the countries that Australians are likely to travel to, we may need to consider things like anti-malarials as well. Hmm. So where can we find more information about that and what should we be telling our patients? It's generally suggested that people go and see their general practitioner or travel medicine provider six or eight weeks before they go away. Uh, we know from a number of studies that many people don't do that. Some people do chat to their pharmacists and the pharmacists can have an opportunity to encourage people to seek pre-travel medical advice. Uh, there's also a, a range of very good websites that people can look up. Uh, one that's particularly good on general travel health advice is the United States Centers for Disease Control and the website cdc.gov and they just go to Travel Health and it's got a list of destinations uh, and a list of topics of different sorts of um, health problems as well. The only thing I'd say is the anti-malarial choices that are made in the United States are somewhat different to Australia. Um, so people would need to um, seek advice from their doctor about particular anti-malarials that we use. And the other one is the World Health Organization has a travel health section as well, at WHO, and that's very good too. Uh, so there's lot, lots of advice available. You mentioned um, also that people may need a doctor's letter. So when would a doctor's letter be required? Um, is it just for things like diabetes and, you know, insulin or would it be for, you know, restricted medicines, which you've mentioned in your article, such as psychotropics, opioids? Yeah, for, like well, for both of those reasons, really. I think anyone who has chronic uh, long-term health problems and is on a number of medicines, it's really useful to have a health summary with the medicines um, written, uh, preferably in generic format, because of course brand names vary around the world. Um, but it's also very important if people are taking a, a medicine that, that may be restricted in some way. Um, that's a really tricky issue because the restrictions do vary from country to country, for, particularly for things like um, opioids and psychotropic medicines, such as amphetamines. And it's quite difficult to know from, say, the websites of the consulate of a particular country, uh, what the rules are for that particular um, place. If in doubt, people can contact the um, consulate uh, of the country they're travelling to. 
they may not um, get a timely answer though. So it's, it's really quite a tricky um, area. And so, you know, talking to their doctor about it um, and if they are going to take an opioid in particular or a psychotropic medication, they really do need to um, have a, a letter stating it's for, for them and under their doctor's signature. Um, so people do need to t think through that fairly carefully. And, and if people, say, have had previous heart disease, they may want to take a copy of a recent ECG, you know, just so, so that if they have any sort of difficulty when they're overseas, some chest pain or something, they, and they need an ECG, the medical practitioner can compare the one done during their travel with a previous one. So that's another thing that can be useful. So I'm sure you're aware recently in the media there's been a lot of attention on um, women on the oral contraceptive pill having the concern of having an increased risk of DVTs when travelling. Mm. Do you have any comments or um, any thoughts about that? Uh, yeah, look, I mean, taking oestrogens does slightly raise the risk of thromboembolic disease, including DVT. It's a very small increase. The much more important risk factor for DVT is having a previous DVT. Uh, and the issue of um, DVT during travel Yes, there is a, some evidence that air travel slightly increases the risk, possibly due to the change in partial pressure of oxygen. And if flights are greater than um, four hours or so, there has been evidence of usually subclinical DVTs that nearly always resolve. But the main risk factors are previous DVT, active cancer, um, so being someone who's being treated for, for cancer, recent pelvic surgery, uh, recent fracture, and interestingly, whether you're either tall or short is a risk factor as well. It may be something to do with um, whether your feet can reach the ground in the plane when, when you're, if you're very short or whether you're cramped in if you're very tall. Um, and of course, if people are over 40, it's not a bad idea to wear the below knee compression stockings. There is some evidence that they uh, reduce risk of um, deep vein thrombosis during flight and to do the exercises that are recommended in the back of um, most of the airlines uh, in-flight magazines. Do you have any other general counselling points for travelling, you know, in relation to the prevention of malaria mm. or traveller's diarrhoea or any other common ailments people might have overseas? Yeah, sure. Well, I guess in malaria, you know, the, the saying, less bites, less risk. And whatever people can do to reduce mosquito bites uh, is helpful. So putting on personal repellent, sleeping in screened accommodation or air conditioning, using knockdown sprays, all of those things. People need to realise, and not everyone does, that malarial carrying mosquitoes, Anopheles mosquitoes bite overnight from dusk to dawn. And if you're in a rural area in a malarious country overnight, that's really when you're most at risk of getting um, infected with malaria. And the other one to mention here is um, daytime biting mosquitoes, which transmit dengue and uh, chikungunya. Uh, they're Aedes species mosquitoes. They like to bite in the morning. And so using personal protection uh, during the daytime as well uh, is, is important. Uh, and in terms of traveller's diarrhoea, you know, the old adage is cook it, boil it, peel it or leave it. It's actually really difficult to do. But um, if food's just been cooked and is still very hot, it's nearly always safe. If water's been boiled, it's, it should be safe. If fruit can be peeled, that's always safe. And there are some high-risk foods which people might be wise to not have on their trips, such as um, uncooked seafood. The other thing that people can do is take some hand gel. So if, a, if a soap and water isn't available before they eat, then they can use some hand gel to clean their hands. So, you know, there's quite a lot people can do to reduce their risk. Um, bottled water, not cleaning their teeth in the local water in a developing country, all of those things. Yeah, thanks so much. Those are all really great counselling points. Yeah. Nick, that's all the time that we have for today. Thanks again. It's been a pleasure having you on the program. You're welcome, Jo. The views of the host may guess on the podcast are their own and may not represent Australian prescriber or NPS medicine wise. I'm Joe Chia and thanks for listening.